toolbox for preparing educators to, to promote progress. My name is Donna Sacco, and I'm a senior technical assistance consultant at the Progress Center and the American Institutes for Research. Today, I'm joined by Riley O'Donnell, our research assistant, and Stephen Pratter, uh, another senior technical assistance consultant with Progress, and Alex Markin, our researcher at AIR and Progress. They'll be joining me and helping you to expand your toolbox to prepare educators. Alex will be helping us with monitoring the chat rooms, as I said, and doing the breakout sessions for us. And again, if you have any problems, just message her in the chat. So let's get started. Uh, as I'm reviewing our agenda for today, please add your name, your role, and where you're from so that we can get to know our audience. Some people have already started doing that, and I see we have people from all over today. So let's look at our agenda. Today, we hope to help you expand your own toolbox to help educators promote progress. And when I say that, I want to stress that this session is dedicated to those of you who may be working in a teacher preparation program or who are providing professional development to teachers within your school district. We'll frame today's work around some of the challenges that we want to address. So after a 20 minute break, we're gonna do this one part. And then after a 20 minute break, we'll be joined by a guest from UNCC, Claire Merlin Noblick, um, to discuss her work with flipped classrooms and align that to our resources. So if you heard Tessie Bailey just a little while ago, she talked about this idea of collective teacher efficacy. And we'd like to suggest that you consider this as you design your professional training. Collector Collective teacher efficacy is like far more than just beliefs. You may have heard her talk about, um, you know, that that analogy with her, or not analogy, the real life with her son and her husband and him feeling like he wasn't capable of helping, but then finding out he actually could help and have a positive effect on student outcome, his child's outcome. So that collective teacher efficacy is important for all of us to be working and doing this together. And it's strongly correlated with student achievement. So it's this combined belief that allows educators to have a tremendous sustained impact on learning. So this was also in these questions were also in the opening session, a little bit different, but basically the same. What do we want for our students, teachers, and families? What's the current reality? Who are the players? What do our students, teachers, and families need to be successful? And how do we maximize our resources? Let's think about those right questions. I know all of you have had to adapt in the last few years, and that'll continue. I think these questions help keep us focused on our goals. And with goals in mind, I want to start by reminding you about how our center and in fact our website is centered around the development and the implementation of high quality educational programming for students with disabilities. I hope you all had a chance to hear Tessie, you know, she really had a passionate opening session keynote address. And, um, you know, we, we believe that by building the capacity and the development of educational programming, those IEPs, and then those the implementation of those IEPs, students have improved access and outcomes, which is that free appropriate public education. So throughout this session, we'll pose challenge questions. Let's start with this one. We're going to do this as a breakout session, so I want you to think about this. How do you structure in-service and pre-service preparation to help educators see the connection between that development and implementation of the high-quality programming provided to students with disabilities? Do you provide instruction that's broken into development and implementation in a way that we think about it, or is this idea kind of new to you? We're gonna go into the breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. And after we return, I want you to come back with something you found surprising or an aha from what you talked about in the group. And you're just gonna add that to the chat room when you come back, the, ch uh, the chat box, all right? 
So let's see, I see someone is just about to enter our group here. And Alex, we have 42 people. We're going to break into groups of, let's say, six in each group um, and see how that goes. All right. Welcome back. I see you're all gradually coming back. I'm going to give people a little bit more time to come back to us. But while you're here, it's about 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. Some people are coming back in sooner. While you're here, add into the chat box what was an aha or a way that you maybe, um, oh, there, Alex. Oh, you're so on top of it. Alex just said, post in the chat something that was surprising or an aha for you in this thinking about. Um, that connection between development and implementation. Hey there, welcome. Welcome. So I gave you a little assignment to come back with something to put in the chat box about something that was an aha or surprising about making this connection between development and implementation. Go ahead and post it in the chat. What, what might be one of the ahas or surprises you may have had? Or if you want to open your mic, you can go ahead and open your mic and tell us, are you thinking about that connection between the two? Thoughtful about professional development and similar messaging for general education and MT uh, and uh, special and MTSS approach. Yes, to be proactive versus reactive. I know, especially these days, it's harder to be proactive, but it's so good to think that way. The importance of valuing having relationships with colleagues and administration to support monitoring. Yeah, so I do, I want to keep you access to professionals, different levels of available time. Yeah, for professional development, it's really tricky. But I really, I want y'all to think about that. You know, sometimes we just think about the um, IEP and all those pieces and trying to make sure that we're meeting when we're supposed to and everything's happening as it's supposed to, all the T's are crossed and all the I's dotted. But really thinking about, like, it's that, implementation, this whole piece. I love this slide where it talks about the procedural, the substantive, and the implementation, and that we need all of that for the FAPE requirements. And you know, that that procedural, just those little bits and pieces, um, that little bits and pieces, really important bits and pieces, actually. Um, but if we think of everything as an isolated concept that you don't have a good sense of how it all fits together. So when I look back to when I was teaching and um, well, when I was teaching in teacher preparation program, I think of how many students didn't see how the IDEA legal requirements and a student's IEP and education all fit together. Everything was just totally an isolated concept and they didn't have a good sense of that it's all bound together. Not only that, when I was a special educator in my early years, I really didn't have it all put together. Each year I had more like, oh, that's it. Or um, so this visual of IDEA FAPE requirements all makes sense. And it helps me say, ah, yeah, that fits together. And we found these images really resonate with people as we talk about the concepts as, of FAPE. Uh, Riley, if you could go to the next slide, you've seen like Tessie was talking about this earlier that these images really resonate with people, this bicycle. And I saw in the chat earlier today in the opening sessions, how people were saying, wow, I really like to see how that, see how that fits those pieces of the bike, all the parts of the IEP, and then putting the bike together, that substantive part, and then the implementation piece of FAPE, that the bike parts and those procedural elements, the bikes all put together with the substantive and the bike and riding it on the road is that visual of FAPE, the IEP fully implemented successfully and with high expectations. So if you were there this morning with that video of uh, Billy as well, thinking about those high expectations. 
Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Riley right now so she can demonstrate some of the structure of our resources and how they're divided up between the development and implementation. Riley, why don't you take it away? All right, thanks, Donna. So what you all see on your screens right now is a screenshot of the Progress Center homepage, and this can be accessed at www.promotingprogress.org. As Donna mentioned earlier, our website is really centered around the development and the implementation of high quality educational programming for students with disabilities. If you notice the tabs near the top of the screen, the website is laid out so users can easily find resources devoted to the development as well as the implementation of high quality educational programming. Building off of this idea, we would first like to highlight the development tab, which is located at the far left in the top of the screen. When you click on the development tab, you will see seven different sections or these blue boxes located near the bottom, which align with some of the components of IEP development. There are multiple ways to access these resources, but to keep that idea of development and implementation, we found that this pathway works really well for that. Under the development tab, you will find several different types of resources to support the development of high quality educational programming for students with disabilities. Some of these resources you see on the screen, as well as more, include our IEP tip sheets, our self-paced training modules, and archive webinars. Throughout the presentation, we'll talk more about these resources and how you might use them to support educators. The second tab over from the top is the implementation tab. This page provides an overview of what we consider to be the ecosystem of the right stuff at the right time in education. These sections here highlight key implementation considerations and resources and are what help build a holistic ecosystem within a school. We know when we understand that barriers exist, but we also know that educators can overcome these barriers by implementing evidence-based practices and assessments, having high expectations for students, using clear processes for decision-making and collaborative teaming, and receiving ongoing professional learning. Similarly to the development tab, there are a variety of resources to support the implementation of high quality educational programming. Some of these resources include instructional practice briefs, protocols for progress monitoring, and materials related to belonging, such as this archive webinar you see on the right. Another feature on our website that we wanted to highlight is a location to find resources that are geared towards faculty and professional development providers. To find these targeted resources, you can move your cursor over the Resources and Tools tab and select for faculty and PD providers from the dropdown. We will continue to go more in depth with some of these specific resources later on in this session. Another resource we're gonna talk more about later is our self-paced tr training modules. <laughs> to find these, you can select the Training tab near the top of your screen. We're gonna go into another breakout for a little bit. In this time, we're gonna give you 10 minutes to explore the progress website, specifically looking at our modules, our tip sheets, and some of the other resources we just highlighted. We want you to spend that time exploring the links in the tabs and discussing with the people in your room. We also would like you to identify a resource you would like to explore more deeply after today's session. So Alex, if you'd like to go ahead and get those breakout rooms started. We'll give you guys some time to just explore the, res the resources on our website a bit. Thank you. Yay. As you guys are getting back, if you could just drop in the chat either the resource or the um, different tool that you plan on spending a little bit more time after the session exploring, you can drop the link, you can drop the name of the resource, you can just drop the general type of resource you hope to explore more after the session. And then Donna, I'm going to pass this back to you and we can keep going. Okay, thanks, R Riley. And I'm going to be, oh, yay, IEP tip sheet. Someone's talking about that right now. And that's what we're going to go into in a second here. So I'm going to give you another challenge. Um, if you can give me the next slide, Riley, there we go. Challenge number two, how do we design our pre-service and in-service preparation to help educators see those connections across all the components of the IEP rather than those standalone pieces? We talked about the development to implementation, but within that development piece, how do we design our pre-service and in-service preparation and training to help educators see those connections across all those components? 
I'm going to go to the next slide and just remind you, remember the bike image. And I think it's such a good thing that resonates so much with, um, with educators. Um, so I want to talk about, we're going to go to the next slide and talk about that importance of getting back to the basics. Um, and I see um, yeah, Kim said so many great resources. I know we're adding resources all the time. And in this afternoon session, we're also going to show you how to use them with flipped sessions and how that might work and some pairings of them. But um, I want to think about just getting back to basics. And Alex added a link to our tip sheets in the chat want you to take a minute to just open one of those tip sheets. And I know someone early on mentioned the tip sheets in the chat from coming back to the um, session after the last breakout. But I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes to look at it. And you know what? I'm not gonna send you to a breakout room again. I was going to, but think about it. I'm just gonna pause for a minute and say, Think about how you might use those tip sheets, whether you're in higher ed or whether you're doing professional development in your schools. So I was gonna do a breakout, but you're gonna get whiplash if we do too many breakout sessions. So just think about those tip sheets. Open up the link to the tip sheets that Alex put in there and read one of them, the PLAFs, the measurable annual goals, measuring progress, whatever, whichever one you want to. And, and look at this, there are two-sided infographics. And let's set up, start seeing in a couple of minutes how you might utilize those tip sheets. Oh, some people have been looking at the practice beefs, uh, briefs too and teaching social behaviors. I love that. Progress monitoring, student engagement, transition, IEP to data collection analysis for continuous improvement. All right, let's see directly. What, what might you? use a tip sheet? How might you set up a training and include the tip sheet in that? Kim was talking about, she liked the page called Implementation of High Quality Educational Programming for Students with Disability. And we've got the high leverage practices included in that. Um, in terms of training, we've got some modules coming out based on those as well. Oh, great. So. Kim, and I know Kim, I love Kim. She was saying they could include those links in some of their guidance document for special ed teachers statewide. And they do a teach camp, which is an induction program. Yeah, you know, so much, I think about induction so much for all of our resources, really. I mean, I was in teacher preparation, so I had those pre-service teachers. But when I think back to me as an educator, I needed that. I needed to learn so much more. Like it's all theory and talking about writing an IEP. But then those first five years as a novice educator, if you have induction and mentoring, these tip sheets could be great for them. Anyone else? Writing an IEP. Yeah, fresh ideas. That's I need I needed checklists and fresh ideas all the time. I'd have sticky notes all over my desk just to give me fresh ideas. I love that, Whitney. Very, very true. I like IEP checklists too. It just helps me. I like all kinds of checklists. <laughs> my daughters make checklists. Um, so let's go down, Riley, a couple of slides and let's go to that image of the plath. And I really, I want, when I talk about, you know, all those little pieces, 
what we really try to do at Progress Center is think about how to connect everything back to that plaque. And I like this, um, this diagram. It's a new image we have. You know, someone, I think, I see Julie Gordon here. Someone was talking about in her Michigan office taking threads in that plaque and how that fits in with so many parts of the IEP. But I want you to think about this image for a little bit because I think it really helps us to think about that plaf is the foundation. That's where we say how we know where the student is, what they can do, where the jumping off point is and where they need to go. What's helped them in terms of um, instruction, accommodations, modifications, right? So the PLAF is connected to the Statement of Special Education Aids and Services. It's connected to the annual goals. The annual goals are connected to that Statement of Special Ed and the annual goals, you know, connect to that measuring progress. But everything, that participation in regular education, state and district-wide assessments, the date, frequency, date, duration, all of those connections, and you know, it brings me back to that idea of the bike again. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is suicide, and Tessie loves this phrase, a suicide. So when you're thinking about the PLAF statement, if it's well designed, it helps prevent us from experiencing this dreadful and harmful a suicide. And so that's where we make decisions about programming. <clears throat> or identify practices or supports based on our assumptions, like rather than the real evidence. So when you think about, oh, you know, I'm teaching a methods course in higher ed, of course they know how to write a goal well because they've been taught that. They know what the PLAF is. Or of course our, our um, newer teachers coming in, our novice teachers, or maybe even our um, more veteran teachers need refreshers and going back to basics. like making those assumptions that they know that I don't have to touch on that is dangerous because it's really helpful to go back to those basics. And, you know, sometimes I know as many years as I taught special education, I needed reminders. You know, they're thinking, oh gosh, I used to do that. What, where did that, where did I stop doing that? Let's go to the next slide. I just want you to take a moment and thinking, <clears throat> think about this and I'm going to pause for a minute. I'll read it and pause. Successful development and implementation of special education depends on the quality of the PLAF statement. Hmm. What do you think? How does that resonate with you? Go ahead and put that in the chat if that resonates with you at all. I like. Brittany said, these tips are a great jumping off point for someone like me, brand new to intervention, but early childhood. Yeah, so we really, our mission for progress is really um, part B, not part C. But you know what? Some of these tools are still applicable for early childhood. Yeah, present levels need to, res need to connect to everything else essential for yeah, that PLAF, it's critical. It has to be the foundation for everything and it should connect to everything for the rest of the IEP. And you know, the part that sometimes is difficult is to make it really objective and not subjective and data-driven. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I want you to think about how you might implement a scope and sequence, whether you're in higher ed or whether you're planning out your professional development for the year. Um, we're going to demonstrate some of the resources and the ways we've used them and trying to connect it all together. I'm going to pass this over to Stephen, and he's going to tell you about some of the work um, that Progress Center has done with the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. So, Stephen, I'm going to pass it over to you and show just how we put all that together. All right. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. So uh, this we wanted to show it, you know, it's it's one thing to just talk about how you can use these resources, but we wanted to give you like a practical example or something we actually have done uh, with with uh, a group of uh, from the 
Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. And just from now on, just to shorten it, I'm going to call them CNMI, CNMI. So, uh, but what this was, uh, this was a, a request that we got from from CNMI. In, CNMI. <laughs> they wanted to uh, some some training for their special education school staff on, on PLAF statements and IEP goal setting. So, if you're like me and I had never heard of CNMI before, uh, <laughs> then uh, until we started working with them, that they are a set of islands in the Pacific Ocean, way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far away from everything. Uh, it's near Guam. If you've heard of Guam or if you know where Guam is is is, is at or if it's more familiar to you, they're right there near each other. Uh, so what they did is they sent a request to, to again to help with the development of the PLAF statements and IEP goal setting for their special education staff. It was a Approximately 200 people uh, through a field initiated request, and uh, I'll talk. I'll, I'll explain what a field in initiated request is real quick before we move on. But uh, so field initiated requests are something that uh, we can do here at the Progress Center. They're they're actually free uh, if you ever wanted to to. Uh, inquire about those, but uh, but they are limited in scope. So what I mean by that is we can only do field initial requests over a certain number of topics and a certain number of trainings, and we only have a certain number of staff that can do them. So we may not be able to accommodate all the ones that we get, but if it's something that fits our mission, fits you know fits the trainings that we have, and and we have some staff that are available to do it, we like to accommodate as many of those field initial requests as we can. Uh, so, uh, but what I want to do here is just highlight how we used uh, our, our Progress Center um, resources, uh, primarily the tip sheets and the modules in this training and, and show you some of the activities that we did just to give you some ideas of, of what you can do with this information and, and, and trainings like this. All right, so this is how we structured uh, the the training for CMNI. This is the training schedule that we use. So you, you can see that uh, for each of the trainings, uh, we had a, a module included in it. And for two of them, we had uh, tip sheets included in them. And each one also includes a practice session. So the idea was that the participants were going to watch the modules on their own ahead of time. So again, those modules, uh, they're on the Progress Center website. They're free. Uh, they take about 30 minutes a piece. Uh, and in those, they have uh, embedded checks for understanding and things like that. And if you complete those, you actually get a certificate of completion after it's done. So what we did is we asked them to uh, watch those 30 minute modules ahead of time. And then they would come together for these practice sessions. And we would meet during these practice sessions. And basically in these practice sessions, what we would do is highlight information from the modules, highlight information from the tip sheets. But then a lot of what the of what of, a lot of what that time was was actually practicing uh, doing the things that are highlighted in the in the modules and the in the tip sheets. Uh, and, and those tip sheets were also provided on day one. So it was, it was something that we referenced back uh, continuously through all the training. So on the next slide is where I'll talk more about what we actually did in those practice sessions. Okay. Uh, so this, this was a great, this, I think somebody actually mentioned this in the chat, this sequence that we had was a great starting point for building the understanding of how all the parts work together, how the PLAV connects to the goals, connects to the services. So it's a great building point, uh, uh of how they start. Um, so in these practice sessions, what we did is, again, we reviewed the important information to set the stage for those participants. So, um, for, you know, we hope that most of the people would actually view the module ahead of time, but just in case they didn't, it was a good way to review what they should have learned, but also kind of set the stage for those people that may not have uh, been able to, to view the module ahead of time. Um, but the, in, the, in our practice session, we also have other knowledge checks that are built in uh, to make sure people are understanding the information. And then that also allows you to clarify any misunderstandings that there may be. And it's just a way to keep participants engaged. You know, it's a way to, instead of just somebody talking or, or whatever, it's just another way, another activity for them to engage in. So uh, also during the practice sessions, we would provide uh, examples and non-examples of PLAFs and goals. So we would show a non-example and then uh, have them identify like, well, what components are missing? Because in the modules and in the tip sheets, it kind of highlights, here are the main essential 
uh, elements of a PLAF statement, or for example. And so we would give a, an example of a non or a non example and say like, okay, what's missing? What 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 should be included that's not included? But then we would also show examples of components or a PLAF that does have all the components. Uh, so we would just wanted to show like what a non example and example would be. So that's part of what we did in these practice sessions. But we also had people actually bring their own PLAFs and goals. So they would bring an IEP so we could look at their actual PLAFs and goals that we have written and we would have activities about those. And I'll explain a little bit more about those activities here in a little bit. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right, so this is just an example of what we did in our training. So this is an example of a PLAF structure that we provided the participants that would include all of those key ingredients that need to be in a PLAF statement. So uh, so just as, as maybe you would, as you're teaching students how to write paragraphs, a good paragraph, for example, you may have sentence starters, you may have what a structure of a good paragraph would look like. So we're kind of doing the same thing here. We're just giving a structure of what we would suggest a good PLAF would look like. And then that way that, that can help them fill in the blanks to, to write those good PLAFs. So we would have this as like a, a structure to give them. And then on the next slide, we would give an example uh, of what this would look like. So here's an example, you know, we're not gonna read through this whole thing. I'm just kind of showing you what this looks like. So, and this is not meant to be an exemplar. We're not saying like, here's the absolute best kind of PLAF that you could write. We're just showing, here's an example of a PLAF. This PLAF includes all the elements that we talk about. And so this is an example of what it would look like. So this is kind of what we did in our training. We would provide examples of, of using those key elements uh, and seeing what that looks like. All right, so now I wanted to talk about a few of the app, uh, the activities that we did. So I said, I mentioned earlier that we had them bring their own PLAFs and their own goals, and we had these activities set up uh, for them to do. So these, this is an example, you could use this as a breakout session, or this is also something you could use as homework. Like if you don't have as much time, usually when we did these sessions, they were about two hours long, an hour and a half to two hours long. Uh, so if you don't have that long, you could do these as homework uh, activities instead of maybe in the training sessions. So in this session, what we're doing is we had them actually have different color highlighters and they would highlight the different needs in the PLAFs, in the PLAF statement, and then say, and then have them look, is there an, an actual service uh, that is, or a modification or something that is related to that need that it's addressed? So is that, is that need from the PLAF actually addressed in the IEP somehow as a service or a modification or, modification or whatever? Uh, so the importance of this is just helping them see that it's critical. That PLAF, like we've already kind of said before, sets the, sets the table for everything. It sets up, this is what the student needs. So once we know what the student needs, are we making services, are we making accommodations and modifications to address those needs that, that, that we say the student has? So this is that activity was trying to highlight uh, that, that connection that we're trying to help, help people make. All right, so here's another sample uh, activity that we did. So this one uh, was about um, uh, goal statements. So again, in the modules and in the, in the tip sheets, we have essential elements of these are the things that should be included with a goal and they're listed there the condition the behavior and the proficiency criteria so what we did here is we had uh we had people uh, participants look at their own goal statements and evaluate them like does your goal statement have all the things here that we're that we say you should have in a goal uh and the the the, the point of this was well number one they could evaluate their own and see how they're doing and number two if they didn't include all those things then they can know how can we refine it or what ways can we make it better so there's the reason that we did this is uh this will help teams know that to help them uh, all start developing goals in the same way. So if they all know they're supposed to have these essential items and they can, they can help each other to make sure they have essential items. So it kind of, it kind of level sets and, and, and make sure everybody is, is doing the same thing across, uh, across all of their teams or across their schools. All right, so here's some lessons learned uh, from us from just doing these. These not only come from the people that, that, that did the presentations, but this also comes from the participants. When we get feedback from all these sessions and participants let us know what can we do better or what worked. So here are some lessons learned from, from the people that presented the, the information and from the participants. So number one was know your audience. Uh, so you can know your audience and you can customize the pace and the content covered to their little level of ready, readiness. So sometimes you may have to spend a little more time on basic concepts 
do just maybe from gaps of knowledge, or maybe these are brand new educators or whatever the, whatever the case may be, but you can uh, customize based on uh, what your audience needs. So know your audience. Uh, number two there, have participants complete the module before the practice session. So I kind of talked about that before, but that's best if you can do that. Uh, we know that's not going to happen 100% of the time. But uh, one thing that a group did say that helped is uh, one group that we trained said they watched the module together. So they, they watched it as a group, and then that way they can kind of process it together. They can come up questions together. So when we come to those practice sessions, they're already ready to talk about it. They already have their questions. They, they already have the things that they're clear and unclear about. So that was a good way to do it. Uh, number two, to try to encourage people to actually do the modules ahead of time, you can ask them to provide their certificate of completion. So you're going to get, they'll get a certificate of completion after they complete the module. So just say like, hey, bring your certificate of completion to the practice session. And that just helps people say like, oh, I better do that. So I'll have my certificate of completion when I go. So just a little tip there. Uh, the next one there is provide opportunities for groups to work as a team and invite general educators to learn as well. OK, so this is going to help build a collective understanding between general and special education, uh, special education teachers. So as we said before, I think as Tessie, Tessie said in her keynote, these are general education students first, and then we, they need special education services to help them in the general education curriculum. So once, as much as general education teachers, uh, educators and special educators can understand the same thing and be have the same language and same understanding as uh, on a topic such as PLAFs and goals, the better, you know, that way everybody's gonna be better to equip to help the student. Uh, the last one there says, uh, encourage participants to replicate the activities with additional IEPs as homework after the session. So if you do those activities like I talked about in the session, then say like, okay, your homework is to do it again with a different IEP. Check your PLAS on this one. Check your goals on this one. Make sure you have services and things to connect to those PLAS just to give them another opportunity to, to practice. And then you could do like consultation and coaching with them and say like, hey, let, let's look at your homework together. What did you find? What did you, did you see uh, things you could improve in your goals? Did you see uh, your, your services connecting to your PLAS statements? It's just another way you can do some consulting and coaching after the trainings. So if you like this structure, if you like this idea uh, of doing it this way, you can actually go back and watch the other team that's presenting at the same time as us. So the, the, their, their training is called Making Connections, Ensuring the Parts of the IEP Work Together to, to Promote Progress. So that's the other one that's going on at the same time, but they're recording it as well. So at, you know, whenever you have time, you can go back and watch that one. And they kind of demonstrate this uh, so you can see how it works in real life. So uh, that's all I had to uh, say about this. I'm going to pass it back to Donna to continue here. Oh, you're on mute, Donna. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so thanks, Stephen. I, I really want to encourage you to, to go back and watch that recording of the other session when you get a chance. I've used this structure myself in working with school districts. And, you know, I did find that sometimes people don't do the self-paced module in advance. It's about 30 minutes, you know, but it might seem like, oh, so much. When our self-paced modules do have um, certificates of completion at the end, which is awesome if you're in higher ed. They can upload those as part of the homework. And we're going to show you in the next, after the break, when we come back, how to utilize these as a flipped um, instruction, flipped classroom, but also how do you get people to really complete those modules and do the work beforehand? So that will bring you some pointers there. I want you to just stop and reflect for a couple of minutes. Think about how you might include some of these ideas and really thinking about scope and sequence. Add some of your thoughts uh, to the chat. Um, thumbs up if you think you can use any of these ideas in your work. Let me see, thumbs up. Can you get that in the reactions down below? And in the chat, how might you include? Yay, thanks. <laughs> How might you include these ideas in your scope and sequence? Thanks, Amy, Iris, Jennifer. So let's see in the chat. I loved an example of present level related to math. Yes. Um, functional performance. You know, actually, some of our examples, I don't know that we have. 
have them written out right now. We're working on some of those, but you may see some of those in the modules. Oh, great. I can't wait for you to print them out either. Um, yeah, but I, you know, think about that sequencing. Like, how do you start with that big foundation? And then what are you going to add in? How do you include the, um, the instruction as part of that as well? Okay, let's go to the next slide. We're going to have a break in a little bit. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what's coming up next at 2.20. We'll start really promptly at 2.20. Um, a good colleague of mine is going to be joining us. She's a friend and colleague from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where I used to teach. Her name's Claire Merlin Noblick, and she's going to lead a discussion on using our resources in a flipped classroom model. So you can do that for professional development or at the university level. Um, I think you'll find some good tips and tools during that. And then we're gonna show you how to pair some of our resources in that next portion of this um, session. So go take a break. You can stay in this room. You can just turn off your camera and your mic if you want, or you can go out and come back. But I hope you do join us because that we have uh, great guest who'll be share, sharing her resources with you. See you back at 2.20. Yay, thank you. Mind you that we are recording. And if you don't want to be on the recording, you can just take your picture off screen. Um, and how are we going to start this with a new challenge? So let's go to the next slide and challenge three. How do we maximize the time by leveraging asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities? Well, joining us for the second part of this session is a friend and colleague, Claire Merlin Noblick from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. As I promised earlier, she is going to be joining us. And um, when I was a professor at UNCC, we were colleagues and we were both very involved in our Center for Teaching and Learning. She teaches in the Department of Counseling at UNCC. And one of her research interests is in using a flipped classroom. So welcome, Claire. Great to see you here. Thank you for inviting me. And hello to everyone logged on. Yay, thanks. Sure thing. So I'm gonna pin you so that people are really looking at you and um, go ahead, Riley. Wonderful, thanks Riley. Appreciate you clicking while I'm speaking here for a bit. Um, so thank you again for having me and thanks for, for listening for those of you logged on. Uh, Donna asked me to speak a little bit about flipped learning today, which certainly is a passion of mine, both as a faculty instructor and as a researcher. Um, but I do have to preface my information about flipped learning with this slide here, right? That if you know anything about flipped learning, you know that this presentation is ironic because it is not flipped. If it were flipped, I would have had you uh, view a brief video lecture before logging on today, say as homework. And then when we came together, we would engage in application activities based on the video lecture you watched. But one important guideline for using flip learning is to know your audience and know your context. And so uh, Donna and I certainly agreed that in this context, it would be better just to do a traditional lecture about flip learning. So if you're not familiar with flip learning, I'm excited for you to learn a bit more about it today. Flip learning is an innovative teaching approach in which students view pre-recorded video lectures outside of class and then in class engage solely in application activities or application-based activities to really apply the course content that they've learned about in the video lecture. And so I'm gonna jump in, Claire. So if it's not a lecture of a of uh, instruction, of a, if it's not a video of a lecture, does that still work? And does it still work for professional development? Yeah, so the one thing I love about flip learning is that there is a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of different ways to interpret it. I see flip learning as a tool. So if it's a tool best used in a traditional K-12 classroom or a higher ed classroom, great. If it's best used in professional development, you really can adapt it to whatever setting you want. And there also are 
a range of definitions. So I have a rather narrow definition here, right? That it has to use a pre-recorded video lecture and you don't have any lecture in class, but other people take more broad views on the definitions. And so um, that pre-recorded video lecture might be a video from another source, or it might be um, some other sort of multimedia engagement assignment you can give students outside of class to teach them the core content. So just to clarify even further, again, if you're new to the concept, it can be helpful to understand how flipped learning or a flipped classroom compares to a traditional classroom. Um, so traditional class or traditional PD um, typically involves lecture occurring in class or in the professional development session, and then homework occurring outside of class. Um, and so for instructors, this typically means planning that lecture, planning that presentation for the time together face-to-face. And then they may plan in-class activities in which students or attendees apply what they're learning. That tends to be a, um, a trend nowadays, right? We don't solely engage in lecture when we're face-to-face, -face, but traditionally there is some sort of lecture component in a non-flipped classroom or PD setting. Uh, to contrast, in a flipped classroom, um, the lecture would be delivered outside of class via that video lecture, um, and, and instructors can still assign homework. So when I flip a class, my students view a 15 to 20 minute video and they read a book chapter or and they read a peer reviewed research article. Sometimes they listen to a podcast episode. Uh, it can vary. Um, and then in class, I am, am tasked with um, really designing meaningful application-based lesson plans in which I get to be very creative and think about how I can put my students to work, how I can have them do group-based activities or independent activities where they apply the knowledge they learned in the video lecture and they synthesize that material to, to really explore it deeper and to improve their learning process. There is a, I see a lot of benefits of flip learning and thankfully research has really helped us understand um, uh, the depth of those benefits, but we've listed a few here. Um, one is that in a practitioner based discipline, flip learning can help solve this dilemma of needing to lecture, but also needing time to practice. So my background is in school counseling and I work in counselor education and we can never have enough time to help our students understand the material they need to know, but also role play counseling or go to our, our counseling labs and practice on each other. And I know this is often the case in teacher education as well um, in other disciplines. And so by removing the lecture from class time, we really open up all of class time for just practice, which can be quite an asset. Uh, Samson Bergman have also pointed out that flip learning is a tool to encourage the synthesis of material to hopefully catalyze critical thinking in students and that higher order thinking because they're not just sitting passively receiving information like they would be in a lecture, but they're really applying it and practicing it in a hands on manner. And it can help emphasize the application of, of key ideas to that practitioner context again. So a few more benefits here to note. Um, a lot of authors speak to the fact that flip learning is really student-centered instead of teacher-focused. If you ever walk into a flip learning classroom, you'll notice this even just visually, that often the instructor is um, not at the front of, a, of the room in a flip classroom, right? But perhaps students are working in small groups or talking in pairs and the instructor is um, walking around facilitating that. Um, experience. It also um, allows students to access content when needed. That was actually one of the evolutions of the modern flip learning movement, or, or one of the impetuses for that movement was Bergman and Sams. They're two teachers who've promoted flip learning from Colorado, and they noticed that they had many student athletes in their high school classroom who would always miss their class at the end of the day because they had to travel pretty far away for um, sporting events because they played on the athletic teams at the schools. But by pre-recording the video lectures, those students could still access the content from home. They weren't missing out on the content in the classroom. And then lastly, um, flip learning certainly allows for a range of differentiation and supporting diverse student needs um, because the students can gain 
access to the content at home when they get to the classroom as an instructor, you can design maybe multiple activities depending on your students learning needs. Um, or you can scaffold those activities or differentiate them in different ways, because you're not obligated to stand at the front of the classroom and lecture, but instead you can have your students um, synthesizing and applying the content they've learned about while you support them. So uh, I think that flipping a class really comes down to three rather simple steps. Um, I do think it's important to have some sort of video lecture component. Uh, then I recommend having a pre-class question. And then of course the in-class activities are the most important part. So when considering how to create a, a video lecture, I would first uh, remind folks that you don't necessarily have to create a video lecture. So a lot of um, video lectures already exist out there and perhaps there's a resource or multiple resources you could use um, that really aligns with your vision for what you already want students to know. Yeah, I was gonna mention something we talked about earlier with embedding um, our self-paced modules that have embedded checks for understanding and they're not video lectures, but I imagine they still work just as well. Absolutely, if they're still delivering course content and if they have built-in I mean, checkpoints, that's even better. Um, and the, the goal for your, your pre-class work, um, your video lecture is going to be just delivering that material. Whether it happens in a module you can access um, from elsewhere, or if you're sitting down in front of a computer screen making your own video lecture, uh, researchers do recommend that these video lectures, if you are going to make your own, are pretty brief. Um, so you might want to keep that in mind. We're not taking you know, a typical 50-minute lecture and just putting it on YouTube. What you are doing instead is looking over maybe a typical lecture you would deliver, really synthesizing it down. So I ask myself when I'm making video lectures, what information do my students need me to explain? Like what can they not already gather from reading the book chapter? Um, I also ask what personal experiences or anecdotes can I add, like I might if I were lecturing in front of them to make things interesting? And what are the most important core concepts that I want them to know? Certainly in a long 30 page textbook chapter, I don't need them to really know everything on all 30 pages. So creating a video lecture forces me to consider what's most important that I want to lecture about. Uh, and then a pre-class question, um, sometimes this is called uh, just-in-time teaching or the just-in-time teaching approach. This is a way to um, survey your students after they've done their uh, homework, their pre-work, after they've watched their video lecture, done their reading, but before they come to class. And I encourage um, anyone who's considering to flip a class to think about the purpose of this pre-class question. So oftentimes it's for accountability, which I completely understand. Um, if you are worried your students simply won't watch these video lectures, I imagine you also are worried they don't typically do the reading you assign or, or the homework you assign at home. A pre-class question can be a question on your course website or something they bring to class um, that you've assigned that they can't answer without watching the video lecture. Um, and so you can also contemplate a range of formats. It can be a typical multiple choice question. Um, it can be more of an essay or you know, a brief essay question, maybe short answer or paragraph where they have to synthesize some of the information they've learned. Um, and you also can use it as a way to point out those most important topics you want them to know. So for example, I teach a human development course. All of my pre-class questions in that course are actually on the final exam. Students don't realize that until they get there, um, but that is sort of my nudge to them that, hey, this is an important topic. That's why I'm asking a pre-class question about it. I really like this because I think, you know, it helps eventually pre-service and in-service teachers learn that, oh yes, we have to do this in advance because we will be needing to apply it. But I also imagine that like for in-service teachers, it might be more of a reflection question related to how they viewed a given concept like a PLAFS or um, you know, after completing the module. So I, I, I think those pre-class questions can probably be pretty important. Yeah, and also informative to you as the instructor or you as the person delivering professional development. So um, I teach graduate level courses, but I, let's say I teach at two o'clock on Thursdays, I make sure that the pre-class questions are due at noon on Thursdays. So I have a couple hours in there to review the answers 
once mm. in a while, all the answers are wrong. And I know I really messed up here, right? Something must have been wrong in my video lecture or, you know, I need to better explain a concept. And then I can go to class knowing we're going to start with me clarifying this concept. Other times, it's just helpful to get a preview of how students took to the material and hopefully confirmation that, that they understood what you were teaching. Yeah. And then the um, the last step is those in-class activities and, and uh, flip learning authors love to point out that the in-class activities are the most important part of a flipped classroom. The video lecture tends to be shiny and new. The pre-class question can be kind of fun and innovative, but what you plan for your time face-to-face -face with your students um, is the most critical uh, element of a flipped classroom because that's where you really are helping them apply the content and synthesize it. There are a lot of activities I'm sure you all as educators already know how to make things engaging and innovative. Um, I do a lot of group work with students. I do a lot of case studies. So I might play a clip of a video or a podcast episode and have them apply the theory that they watched a video lecture about. Or I'll have them write their own case study and then give it to another partner or group who has to analyze and apply the concepts they've learned about. If you're in a practitioner discipline um, like I am in counseling, it's also just a great opportunity to embed a lot of role play or practice um, and let students give feedback to one another. Yeah, I love that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So just some final tips here. If, if you are new to flipped learning, I know it can feel um, a little bit intimidating. Uh, just like any new teaching approach, right? We all are afraid of it at first, um, but I have had a lot of success um, as have some of my colleagues with starting small. So if you are mapping out say an eight week unit in your course, you know, maybe you try flipping two or three of those class sessions. This gives you some time to create or find the video lectures or the modules. Um, and also gives you some practice designing those in-class activities. And then maybe the next time you teach that unit, you do two or three more. And then the next time you finish it off, that can be one way to manage the workload uh, that can go into to flip learning. You also can collaborate. So if you're teaching the same subject area or delivering the same PD as someone you know elsewhere, you certainly can um, share the, the duties of making a video lecture or planning those activities. And of course, it's also helpful to embrace the prep as an investment. So I, I flipped a, a school counseling course this past spring. I first flipped it, I want to say three or four years ago. I still use the same video lectures that I made three or four years ago. I might update one every semester because I think, you know, I really don't love that one or things have changed on, about that content area, um, but it is helpful. A lot of um, educators, I think, are scared off because they think flip learning involves way more work than a typical non flip classroom. I would disagree with that, especially if you already have resources or modules available like you do here. Um, and if you keep in mind that even teaching in a non flip way, you still have to prepare a whole lecture. Um, so there certainly is, is an investment if you um, prep ahead. And of course, like always, you know, seek your participant feedback, ask your students halfway through a flipped unit um, what their experience of it is, if they're enjoying it, that can be validating to yourself to keep going. And according to the research, most students do have really positive perceptions of their flipped learning experiences. And we have a lot of research showing that flipped learning um, can improve academic achievement and learning. So I would keep that in mind as well. Thanks so much, Claire. I hope you'll stick around. People are, can put comments or questions into the chat and maybe you okay. can go ahead and answer them in the chat that'd be awesome um, i think you know also what i've noticed as i used to flip my classrooms and i'd have classes as big as 150 mm -hmm. but then students would work in groups to apply the knowledge they learned in the discourse that was going on and the real like deeper level understanding um, was just awesome and they loved those interactive classrooms yeah. um, you can same thing in PD. So. That's really, really impressive. I, I hear sometimes from folks, oh, I teach, yeah, 200 student class. How could I flip? But I think you are a really great example. Like, well, well, why not? What would be different? You know, if anything, you're giving your students a lot more engagement than they would get otherwise. That's yeah. Great to know. Yeah. And they always had to have something at the end of the session, like an exit ticket to hand in. Sure. So, sure. Thank well, you. I have 
Thank you, Claire. And then stick around. I, I'm sure people go ahead and put questions in the chat and she'll be able to answer them for you. And then um, Riley, I'm going to turn it over to you um, so that you can talk a little bit more about our self-paced learning modules and other resources. All right. Thank you, Donna. And thank you, Claire. So what we're seeing first here is how to access the self-paced modules. I know we've talked about these a great deal so far, but if you want to locate them, you're just going to go back to the Progress Center homepage, and you can click on the training tab at the top of your screen. We are adding our self-paced modules to our learning management system all the time. Right now we have eight modules posted, and they are roughly 30 minutes each, which can be completed at your own pace. And as Steven said earlier, they include knowledge checks and a certificate of completion. The current learning modules that we have posted are Introduction to Federal and State Laws Impacting Students with Disabilities, the IEP Team, Who's Who and Other Considerations, IDEA and the IEP from Compliance to Progress, the What and Why of Measurable Annual Goals, Path to Progress, Developing and Implementing High Quality Educational Programming, the What and Why of Present Levels of Academic Achievement and Functional Performance, or the PLAF Statement, Introduction to Intensive Intervention, and many more on the way. So if you find one or any of the modules that you might find interesting, you can click on it and this is the page that you'll be brought to. When you click on the module, you'll be given a lot more information about the course, including an overview and related resources on the topic of the module. If you decide to go ahead and complete the module or assign it to people, you can access it by clicking the green bar located at the top right hand of your screen. In order to access these modules, you do have to create an account. This will help us keep track of what modules you have completed and which ones you've completed yourself. These modules and tip sheets are a great way to flip your university classroom or to have teachers come prepared, having completed this pre-work so that they have a foundation to start from before a professional development session. In addition to our self-paced modules, we have archived webinars on a variety of topics for a bunch of different audiences which include additional resources on the topic and can be viewed in full or in part before a lesson or training session. We're gonna pause again. In your experience, do you have any tips for using a flip model classroom successfully perhaps? If you do, provide us a thumbs up if you feel like a flip, flipped classroom model could be used in your professional development or university class settings. In the chat, how might you use a flipped classroom model with our resources? Do you see any challenges with using this model? How might this model change your instruction? So think about that for a bit. And when you feel moved or have an idea, you can add your response in the chat. I see Claire's added some information there um, in the chat. That can be really helpful. I also see Lainey said that she uh, is, is using it or she thinks she can use it. So that's awesome. Yes, please feel free, add to that chat. Whitney says she wants to try. She thinks the challenge would be students completing the task. And that's, yeah, that's why like you get these certificates at the end of completing the assessment, but I mean, the um, self-paced module, which is awesome because they have to hand that in to show that they completed the assignment, right? And there are other ways of doing that as well. I don't know, Claire, if you wanna add into the chat different ways that um, students can I know if you're using a learning management system, then you can see that they've watched something. With our self-paced modules, they can't skip ahead. <laughs> Steven, I'm gonna pass this over to you as we head over to our next challenge. All right, thanks. All right, so let's look at our next challenge. It says, 
how do we facilitate discussions about critical topics related to related to developing and implementation of high quality educational pro programming for students with disabilities? All right. So uh, if you think back to uh, earlier today to our keynote presentation and uh, where Tessie played that video uh, about high expectations with Billy, and uh, that's one of our stories from the classroom that we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Uh, but we're going to model this this challenge. We're going to model how to how we could do this challenge. Uh, with a video about belonging in tomorrow's session on belonging. So if, if you are signed up for that session, then you can look forward to that. And if that sounds interesting to you, then you can register for that session as well. But we're going to look at that more tomorrow about belonging. All right. So these stories from the classroom. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. There you go. Where can you find these stories from the classroom series? So if you go to the homepage, uh, and you click on the resources tab. So when it says resources and tools, uh, there is there will be a drop down, and then you'll see in the drop down our stories from the classroom are one of the the things you can select from that drop down. So they're very accessible, very easy to find from the homepage of the website. So these stories from the classroom, let's talk about a little bit about what they are exactly. So they're three to five minute videos. Y'all saw one today. So you saw an example of one, what, what one looks like. Uh, they're three to five minute videos on the following topics. There's belonging, uh, honoring parent perspectives, language, high expectations, inclusion and in activities, and disability as an equity issue. Okay, so if you go to that stories from the classroom page, you'll see these videos uh, then you can use these as discussion starters for these topics. So if you're thinking of a way to how can we have a good discussion or a hard discussion about one of these topics, you, this is how you can start it off. This can be the introduction to having that conversation. All right, on the next slide. Uh, so we're, we're adding something new now to these resources. We're adding these classroom discussion guides. So uh, so this year we're pairing uh, those videos, those uh, stories from the classroom videos with discussion guides that will build a structure that's developed by the IDEA partnership and can provide a great structure for stakeholders to make meaningful conversations together. So these discu discussion guides can be used to facilitate uh, staff discussions. Excuse me. Uh, so they're going to include information to support facilitating the discussion, uh, reaction questions that will support teams in reflecting and sharing their perspectives, application questions designed to build understanding and action, and additional resources to support further uh, focus on that topic. Uh, so we currently have one uh, developed that accompanies the video about words matter. Uh, but we're, there are two that will be coming in the near future, one on fostering belonging and the other about setting high expectations. So those will be coming soon. So I'm going to send it back to Donna for her to continue. Uh, actually, thanks. Thanks so much, Stephen. I just wanted to um, add to that. Actually, the one we have on fostering belonging is the one that we have um, ready to go. Um, the words matter one, you're going to help us with that today. Um, but the fostering belonging has links and resources that go along with it. Um, we're also going to do a one pager. So these were actually modeled after um, some discussion guides IDEA partnership created. Ours are different, um, but we used their structure to, to model these. So like say a principal is going to um, do PD in for their his teachers or her teachers. And you can just look at it quickly, play the video and some possible discussion questions are there as prompts. And it's just a guide to get that conversation going. We're gonna show you a video now. So you saw the one about with Billy earlier. This one, um, I really utilize some of my favorite students from UNCC for these videos. So this one is called Claire, uh, whoa, whoa, I'm thinking of Claire, the, um, words matter. And this is Julie Lang. Um, watch the video. And what I want you to think about as you're watching the video is how could you use this to start a discussion and what questions might you ask? Okay, let's listen to the video. In this Stories from the Classroom video, Julie Lang recalls how, 
As a high school student with cerebral palsy, one teacher's poor choice of words stunned her, while another teacher's high expectations launched her forward. Both of these experiences helped her become the fearless teacher she is today. Um, there was one teacher in particular who um, wasn't sensitive um, to me having cerebral palsy and she wasn't super rude about it. She just wasn't aware. She said, Julie, can I talk to you after class? And I said, sure. And she very politely said to me, do you have any special instructions? And I knew at that point because um, I was a sophomore in high school. Um, so I knew at that point what she was getting at. Um, she was getting at, um, do you have an individualized education plan that I need to follow? Um, but that's not how her words came across. They came across as if she was saying, Julie, do you have any special instructions? Um, and my first reaction was, no, I'm not a toy in a box um, that you put together. I'm a human and I'm in math class. And I, I just, I was in tears. Um, for the rest of the day and i share that story because that was truly a teacher who was trying very very hard to be sincere in her approach to having a diverse student but she failed because no one um had taught her that words are super powerful another teacher who gave me a lot of inspiration was my civics teacher um, in high school. And he said, um, said, Julie, you need to go take that advanced placement United States history course. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, yes, you can. And I said, but I'm scared. And he said, okay. He said, go do it anyway. You, you've got the potential. Um, and when somebody says you have the potential, then I want to see that potential come to life. Um, the light just kind of went off that people that I admire are watching me and they want me to do something great. But I encourage um, teachers at all of at all levels to ask questions. Don't assume that you know. Just remember that anybody who is fighting an obvious difference um, is being very, very brave. Um, and bravery can come from things that most people take for granted. And you're never going, you're never going to know what that piece of bravery or courage is. But know that somebody is um, coming into your classroom with an extraordinary amount of courage um, and you're either going to um, let let that courage unfold or you're going to, um, as the author of The Courage to Teach says, you're going to let that student be their fears. And that's never something that we want to happen. You can have your fears, but you we don't need to be them. Julie Lang is a high school history teacher at Walnut Grove Christian School in North Carolina. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the video being out of sync. Um, believe me, it's not. <laughs> when when you download it i think sometimes when you're doing this virtually so my suggestion when you're using videos um, virtually is either embed the video in your powerpoint or if you're doing it from online and it's virtual to play the whole video first so that it catches up um, sometimes you have to play it once or twice to keep it in sync but the 
video itself is actually in sync if you just play it right off the website for yourself or if you're in a classroom or if you download it um, for a student to access with the link. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, go to a breakout session. And in this breakout session, what I want you to do is come back with two questions you might ask to facilitate a robust discussion when you're using a video, this video, this video in particular. Thanks, Brittany. I think it's a very powerful tool too. Julie is amazing. Um, but so if you were gonna show this to in-service teachers or to pre-service teachers, what I want you to think about, what questions might you throw out there to facilitate a discussion um, using this video to start to as a jump start? So Alex has put the question that we want you to come back with. Um, thanks. Um, and we're going to let you go to 10 minutes, come back with two questions you'll put in the chat. Okay, thanks. We'll see you soon in 10 minutes. So I see people are starting to join us again from the from the breakout session. Welcome back. Um, I'm welcome back. I'm going to give people a chance. We'll get our numbers back from those breakout rooms. I think my breakout room visual is in real time. <laughs> So it's closing in three, two, one, yay. So I am going to tell you guys, this is going to be so helpful to us because we have some ideas. We have a draft of our discussion guide that goes along with this video, but please add um, one or two questions that you might pose to a group of pre-service or in-service teachers or administrators or to whom you're providing professional development, what kinds of questions might you um, ask to just prompt a discussion, a really uh, robust discussion using this video? I'm gonna let you, give you some time to type. How do teachers' words impact Julie's sense of belonging? Yeah, so tying this video back to the belonging as well, we have a different video we use for belonging with all the resources to go to it, but that's great, tying those two things together. I like that. I think sometimes teachers don't know how to talk to students about their IEPs either. Yeah. Please continue to add um, your thoughts. How would the teacher have phrased their question for special educators, uh, special instructions more sensitively? And do the teachers have access to the important information? Yes, that's a great one, Andrew, because I know, you know, elementary school, it's almost easier. When students get into middle and high school, it's much harder to make sure all those multiple teachers uh, know what's on the IEP. We all have fe fears. We don't have to live by them. Isn't that a great one? Speak to your with your elbow partner about how this quote speaks to you, then watch the video. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so putting the quote out there first and then watching the video, I love that. Guys, I love these ideas. Keep adding them into the chat box and, and I wanna keep those so that we can possibly um, help formulate our discussion guides and you will have contributed to that. All right, so let's keep going and I'm gonna move on so that we can get you out of here in five minutes. I wanna show you how to put it all together for professional um, learning. So um, what I think about, I'm gonna show you some pairings and where do you start, right? With all of this. So 
on the next slide, you'll see that one of the good modules to start with is IDEA and the IEP from compliance to progress. And that module, about 30 minutes, has that bicycle image in it, the bicycle parts all put together and then getting it on the road. I think that's a good starting point. A lot of people don't really know what the law says. What does IDEA say? And our tip sheets will say like what the law says, but then in addition to that, you know, what might you also do for best practices? Um, let's go to the next slide. So here, here are some of my perfect pairings. Oh, so the first one is using that self-paced module of the what and why of present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. And then you can pair it with this, the tip sheet on PLAPS, where they can have that, refer to it while they're watching. And then later in class, if you are flipping your model, when they're actually um, applying their knowledge. And then if you wanted to add a video to that, you could add this next one, stories from the classroom, focusing on strengths within assessment and classroom instruction. She also talks about how to include students in on their own data so that they understand their data better. And then on the next slide, here's another. I'm just giving you some examples of how you can put our different materials together. So this other pairing I have is the what and why of measurable excuse me, annual goals. So that's the self-paced module. And then you could add in on top of that, the tip sheets for measurable annual goals. You could also, um, uh, there's another tip sheet on uh, measuring progress for on your, on your goals. And then there's also a vi video here, which um, you saw this morning if you were at Tessie's um, opening. This is the Billy video, Billy Pickens, also from UNCC, stories from the classroom appreciating high expectations so that you really want students to not, you know, you want to see them make progress in their IEPs, right, given their individual circumstances. So these are just some ideas that I wanted to give you so that you have an idea of how you can put them all together to use them um, for a whole lesson and how you can think about, you know, looking at our, um, our resources and how might you structure the sequence of your courses in, um, in teacher preparation where all of the professors are kind of understanding that IEP and how they then incorporate it into their methods courses. Um, and you can think about it for pacing your professional development throughout the year. So those are just a few of our ideas. Anyone have questions? Feel free to ask us any kind of questions. We're going to be staying for the um, like open session where people can just come and talk. Um, and that happens right after this. I'm just going to stay right in this link, I believe. Is that right, Riley? Do we just stay here for the room or it's a different link? Different link. Okay, the different link. All right, so I'm going to go to that other link. And then um, in that link, we'll just have some um, sharing from you all. Keep adding questions if you have any. We'll keep monitoring the chat. But if you want to stay up to date, sign up for our newsletter on our homepage and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I like to always put things on Twitter and Facebook so you can uh, follow us there. And again, um, just as a reminder, we are funded by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Ed Programs. So we have not officially endorsed any product, commodity, service, or enterprise mentioned in this presentation. And to remind you what's coming up tomorrow. So um, these optional networking discussions, we're gonna do one tomorrow, 1015 to 1045. And I was talking about the one we're having this afternoon right after this. Um, then we have a break general session panel discussion. I am gonna be leading that panel discussion. We'll have three people from our stories from the classroom, uh, teacher of the year in Washington state. Billy's gonna be there. So you get to meet him and hear all about what he has to say. Um, and a parent and a special education director and someone who does assistive technology for DC public schools. And then we'll have concurrent sessions again. So don't forget about our schedule tomorrow. We have some references here, some of the things Claire talked about. She's written and researched on the topic of flipped classrooms. So 
don't forget you have to register for each session independently. So if you haven't registered um, and you'd like to attend, there's still time. You can do it right before the session and you're still okay. So um, thank you, Brittany. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that this is helpful to you. I understand it's a little different from early childhood, but hopefully the messages are you know, the same, that we really want to get to know our child, our children, our students individually and have high expectations and make sure we change the face of teacher preparation coming forward. So thank you everyone. And I will jump into that um, open discussion room in a little bit. Thanks, thanks Iris. Thank y'all. Thank you, Claire. Let's see, are you still there? Yay, thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Julie, good to see you. It was so good to see you today. <laughs> Thanks. All right.